welcome to all of you across Europe and around the world. We are so glad to have you with us on the live stream. And it's hard to imagine we are just 30 minutes away from the end of our Wednesday. Only one more day to go here at Cisco Live Barcelona 2020. We have been having an amazing time. Energy remains high. The music is still pumping all the way around us. Uh, the drinks are flowing. The food is flowing. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of tech. It's a lot of talk. Exactly what we love a Cisco Live to be. Everywhere you go here on the show floor, what are the words that we're hearing? Connection conversation, inspiration, education. That is exactly what this event is all about. And it's why we always encourage all of you to get to a Cisco Live. If you've never been to one of them before, we want to see you either here in Emir, we want to see you in June in the US, wherever is closest to you, most convenient or least convenient, and you want to take a nice trip, we want to make sure that we see you all there. My name is Steve Moulter. I'm one of four great hosts that we have here at the show, and you're going to meet the rest of them during this segment as well. Please remember to continue reaching out to us us on all forms of social media using hashtag C-L-E-U-R. This is the social media hub directly next to me and they are listening to everything that you say, watching all of your photos, all of your posts, and we want you to keep connecting with us and we will connect back with you. We're going to kick off our daily wrap show here with an interview that we recorded. Our own David De La Cruz had a chance to sit down with Anthony Grieco and discuss data protection. We're going to check that video out right now. We'll see you right back here in the studio in just seven minutes. Enjoy. Hi, I'm here today with uh, Anthony Greco, who is the Trust uh, Strategy Officer in part of our Security and Trust Organization, or STO for short. And uh, because the security landscape is getting so much more complex for both uh, Cisco as well as our customers, you know, the threat landscape is getting harder and harder, but also the, the things that we're trying to protect are getting more and more complicated as well. So I'm um, here with uh, Anthony today. Uh, thanks for joining us, first of all. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So um, I kind of teased it a little bit in the intro there, but why is trust as a concept so much more important now? With all the new technologies that are sort of coming into play, what's, what's really changed it, changed the game, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's, I think we're really at an important time. Uh, there's an inflection point happening in all of our customers' environments and governments all around the world. Uh, Chuck said it at Davos uh, th this week or this past week talking about how uh, technology is a strategy, right? It is the future. Uh, and that core dependence on technology means that businesses and governments and, and the whole world is going to depend on technology in ways that it hasn't in the past. So whether it's 5G or critical infrastructure or financial institutions, ultimately you're going to have to trust that infrastructure. And the critical components today based off of us kind of talking to our customers around the globe that impact their trust in that infrastructure, their ability to deliver those capabilities is security and privacy. And so ultimately what we see is this confluence of events. People are waking up to the importance of technology and how critical it is, not just as an adjunct to their business, but their business. And as a result of it, they're going to have to trust it. And that's really what the future is going to lead to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even as a private person, right, so much more of your life is online, is digital, and uh, you, you have to have faith in those organizations that you're entrusting with your data. Um, you, you mentioned before, um, oh, well, you know, when customers or are trying to choose a partner to work with, you know, when they're making those purchasing decisions, do you have sort of some guidelines or criteria how they can evaluate if they're sort of a trustworthy partner to work with? Yeah, I think this becomes the next generation of conversations that customers are having today and will continue to evolve. I think about it in three ways. Um, uh, fundamentally, we think about being trustworthy, transparent, and accountable. If you think about that framework of evaluating your partners, of who's going to help propel your business and your strategy going forward, I think that's the right way. We, so we think about trustworthy, we think about the things that the company or organization is doing with technology to make sure security and privacy are baked into their fundamental operations of their business. So that's things like secure development life cycles, that's things like making sure you've got right, the right trustworthy technologies built into the products and services. Make sure that you're ultimately controlling risk that may come from uh, the value chain or supply chain of the, uh, of the organizations. There's a whole suite of things that really are the actions you take to be trustworthy. That's one thing, so trustworthy. The second thing is transparent. A, a lot of what customers want to know and need to know today in order to understand the risk of, of doing business with a company is to really understand what's going on behind the curtain. So they need to understand what the relationships are between, say, customers and governments or technology partners and governments. How do they treat data? How do they treat privacy? How do they uh, otherwise design these things into their business? That transparency in those areas is essential. And the third category is accountability. 
Uh, that's, you know, in many cases, standing up and saying, uh, we, you know, we didn't get it right. Here's what we're going to do about it. Uh, you know, oftentimes vulnerabilities show up in that way. And, uh, and, and so we think about accountability as a critical bit of it because none of this is perfect. And, and, and we've got to really think about how you're accountable for and improving on this discussion. So really, it's those three things, being trustworthy, transparent, and accountable. Absolutely, and I think trustworthy is a great uh, key word to hone in a, lot, a little bit more. Um, we've heard the term Cisco trustworthy systems mentioned a few times during the week. Um, it, that this is like a service that people can get from Cisco, or, or can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, it's you know I, I'll tell you when uh, uh, we launched the uh, next generation of the internet uh, just before Christmas, uh, Jonathan Davidson stood up on stage and said, "In the SP portfolio, we've built trust and security and trustworthy technologies into those platforms." That is an incredible, momentous state for us to be in. Across 200 product lines inside of Cisco, we have things like secure anchors and trusted, uh, trusted anchors for things like making sure the integrity of the product is, is, is robust and secure. Because increasingly, the network, the infrastructure itself is the point of attack. It is where adversaries are going because you can disrupt so much from there. And so the trustworthy technologies are not features or functions that you turn on or buy. They're built into the product, the core of the products. And they're available to and anyone that's buying our products as a part of uh, a part of those products. They're not something separate. You don't have to turn them on, but they are there to ensure the integrity of the products themselves. It's like a badge of trust that we put onto our Absolutely. product, etc. Yeah, awesome. And uh, obviously, we're in Europe here, the, the home of the famous GDPR. I feel like pretty much every single one of my conversations with customers comes up at least once. Um, what? What are the things that we do that demonstrate that you know Cisco can be taken seriously when it comes to privacy and trust? Yeah, the, the, uh, privacy is a critical component. So first and foremost, for privacy, you've got to have security. So we talk a lot about what we do to secure our enterprise and the things that we sell to our customers. But then on top of those uh, those security components, we we really think and operationalize things like where is the data, how is it protected, who has access to it, all of those fundamental things that sound really easy but are, are in many cases difficult. And when it comes specifically to privacy, we spend a lot of time both being transparent with our customers by producing things like data privacy sheets that describe how we use data in our offers and how we treat it and who's protecting it and, and those sorts of things. But then also we have a whole practice around privacy engineering so that all offers that we're producing, all the stuff that we sell, has been through a process where we think about privacy from an engineering perspective. Absolutely. And I guess um, for the last question, just uh, we've got a couple more, a uh, little bit more time. Um, a lot of customers think, you know, security policies, security projects slow down the organization, but I've heard that your opinion is that that's not the case. Well, I think the, the ultimate thing that we've got to get around, our heads around is when you get security in at the right place at the right time, you think about trusting what you're going to deploy and understanding the risks, you can go faster. Uh, a classic, I mean, the data proves this out. We did a survey of a thousand uh, senior IT leaders across the world, across a bunch of different uh, verticals, and 40, almost 40% 40 of them had, had to stop a major transformational initiative that was going to transform their business, a digital transformation, because they hadn't thought enough about security and privacy. That's slowing down the business. So when you think about security and you trust what you're doing, ultimately because you've thought about security and privacy appropriately, you can go faster. And it's slower indeed if you forget. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your insights, Anthony. Um, you heard it here first. Cisco should be your number one partner for security. So um, thanks for joining us, and we'll be back soon. Another fantastic interview from David De La Cruz, who, guess what, is standing directly over here to my right-hand side. I just have to turn my head to the right, and there you are. Well done, uh, David. You've really gotten some, some good information throughout the course of the day, but nice interview there with Anthony, and it sounded like he really was able to sort of take this story and, 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 and bring it to the next level in terms of understanding. Absolutely, Steve. And uh, continuing the conversation on data privacy, um, I've actually, well, it's very much current events because uh, just this week, uh, in time for Data Privacy Day, we released the 2020 Data Privacy Benchmark Study. And standing next to me, two gentlemen who are very much involved in the creation and of that report. So uh, I've got Harvey Jang, VP of and Chief Privacy Officer, and Robert Waitman, Data Privacy Director. That's right, isn't it? That's right. Perfect. So um, thanks so much for being on the show, guys. Uh, we've got a couple of questions um, we want to talk about today. Firstly, um, Robert, this is the third year that Cisco has published this report. Uh, this year, what are the, the main insights that we've, we've gained from it? 
Well, it's been very exciting to take the research that we've done over a three-year period and really be able to culminate it about what is the value of privacy investment for business. We've looked at things like reducing sales delays and better security outcomes, and this year we were able to take responses from over 2,500 um, companies out there and figure out actually what the benefits are. So we've calculated, the first big finding of this is that the return on investment on privacy is 2.7. So for every $100 you spend, the average company spends on privacy, they're getting $270 back. Or 100 euros, you get 270 euros back. We're in Barcelona after all. Yep. So that's a big thing for companies to say, this is a very good investment. One of the best investments they probably can make is in fact in privacy. The second thing we found is that those companies who go a little more beyond the minimum, that are beyond just the compliance, are getting even better benefits. They're getting security benefits of having fewer breaches and less records exfiltrated. And they're getting higher returns when we look back to that ROI. And the third thing we found, which is brand new for us, is the value of certifications. And we're finding that privacy certifications are an important buying factor in the market, and companies that have them are streamlining their process and making it easier to do business with them. Perfect. And uh, shifting to you now, Harvey, um, obviously as Chief Privacy Officer, you're responsible for privacy at Cisco. Right. Um, can you share some use cases of how these insights that you've learned from the report are actually right. being applied in Cisco? Right. I mean, this report was actually very helpful in validating a lot of the assumptions that we had. We took a major shift. You mentioned GDPR and everyone putting a lot of effort into compliance. But we took a shift to say, look, it's not just about compliance alone. Privacy is a business imperative and even an ethical responsibility that companies have to take on. And so being willing and sh investing beyond the bare minimum to be defensible legally, we decided to go further and mature our program as far as we could. And Robert mentioned certifications and the importance of certifications. What we did was we aligned our privacy program to global standards and frameworks, not just the European ones, but the Asian privacy laws as well, and Americas. So totally global, because we operate in 170 countries, and there's about 120 different jurisdictions that have privacy laws on the books. So taking these certifications that cover 50 of those jurisdictions, the EU's binding corporate rules, APEX cross-border privacy rule system and privacy recognition for processors, and the EU-US privacy shield. And with those certifications, we're getting validation from the regulators themselves and accountability agents that were authorized by the regulators to look at our program and confirm that we've aligned to their principles and their values in setting up our privacy program. And so using that as demonstrable compliance to show our compliance capabilities has really paid off in the marketplace as it's important as the studies show to our customers. Perfect, and one uh, last question, we've only got a little bit more time, is uh, have you got a, an example, uh, Robert you mentioned ROI and the benefits that customers can get, have you got a concrete example of a customer that's been able to benefit from implementing these findings? Well, there are a few things. We've sought over thousands of companies, you know, the fact that if they've invested a little bit more, they are much more likely to see those security outcomes. We've heard it anecdotally from customers as well, who now have, if they've gone through the process of putting their data house in order, that they are seeing the tangible benefits of either competitive advantage or being able to do business. In fact, in many markets, our, our customers, any company, can't do business unless they're able to answer these questions about privacy. So it's not really something that's a nice to have. Maybe in the past it's been a good thing to sort of get done. Now it's really a critical business enabler and something that is on everyone's mind from board level down to every single employee about what you've got to get right to make sure you've got the customer experience, you know, the brand and the loyalty of the people you're working with. So it, it's, it's a really critical part of doing business today. Yeah, and, and to truly leverage the ROIs, leverage the existing programs you have in place. As Anthony mentioned, security being foundational. And we just built upon our security foundation of secure development lifecycle and added our privacy impact assessment in there. And that really helped in the process. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for your guys, uh, time, guys. Uh, privacy, obviously, a critical topic for many, many of our customers. Uh, if you do want to learn more about privacy or perhaps download the report that was just talked about, uh, please head to uh, our website, cisco.com, and you'll be able to find out more. But I think we've got a last segment to close out the day, and we'll be heading over to Steve for that. We will indeed. Harvey, Robert, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate you being on set with us, David. Great job once again. All right, now we get to bring you one of our very favorite segments of our show, something that we call the startup of the day. Cisco is one of the largest VCs, venture capitals out there in the world. Uh, we offer our customers and our partners a really interesting lens into cutting edge startups and tomorrow's disruptive technologies. Here at the show, we have got eight 
of the most prominent startups in the industry. They're over in the Cisco Investments Village, and that's where we're going to head to right now with my buddy Zane. Zane, who is our startup of the day? Thanks, Steve, and look, we have a really interesting t-shirt for you there. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> All the surprises over here at the Investment Village. This is my favorite place. It's just full of energy. So look, let's look at what we have today. We're with the startup Rookout, Liran. Great to meet you. So we're with Liran. He's the CTO of Rookout. Introduce yourself. So my name is Liran Khamovic. I'm Rookout's co-founder and CTO. And it's my first time here at Cisco Live. Fantastic, Liran. So Liran, you know, when you start at Ruka, what's, it, what's this workflow that you're really bringing? What are you doing for your customers? So, the first and foremost uh, workflow Ruka brings is remote debugging. Well, remote debugging has been around for ages. It's traditionally been a very cumbersome and fragile process, requiring a lot of skill and effort. And most developers couldn't use it for most real-world use cases. And now with Ruka, everybody can easily remote debug anything they want. Brilliant, so it looks like you're giving users more visibility into what they're doing. Now I heard that you're doing some work with App Dynamics. can you tell us a little bit more about that? So AppDynamics have a very proven track record of monitoring overall system health, identifying issues, and providing you with actionable insights. Using Rookout, the dynamic collection capabilities, user can now dig even deeper into the code level and figure out why either code behaving the way it does, solving issues even faster. Fantastic. So what, are the, what would you say the biggest benefits are then that customers are seeing who are using that dynamics? What does Rookout really give to those customers? So by bringing better observability into running application, Rookout increases developer productivity, reduces developer burnout, and shrinks the time to resolve issues. And I think this is so, so important, um, Liran. You know, we're always talking about applications. If anything goes wrong with the code, it's the end users that suffer. Now, I wanted to, I've just caught my eye there on the logo here, the Rookout logo. Can you tell us what's the inspiration behind the logo? Like, how did you guys come up with the name? So, Rookout was named after Rook, which is a very clever kind of a crow, which is known for solving puzzles. Rookout is essentially like having a very smart bird inside your application that can easily get you the data you need to solve the riddles you're facing. Our logo is a bird standing on a curly brace, showing our ethos of helping developers with their code. Brilliant. That's a great story, Liran. Great story. So look, is this your first time at Cisco Live? Yes, it is. So tell us, what are you looking forward to this week then, since it's your first time? It's my first time also. Well, it's great being again in Barcelona, and there is an awesome Cisco event, investments party later today that I'm really hoping to go to. Fantastic. Well, we heard them, you know, the party's later on, so everyone, get yourself to the investments party. Liran, just to finish up, final question. If people are watching and they think Rookout looks amazing, where can they find out more information about your idea so, and your startup? So just go out to rookout.com and you can either reach out to us or even sign up yourself for free and get started. Fantastic, Liran. Thanks very much for your time. And we're going to throw it back over to the studio. Steve, what do Thank you have for us? Thank you. Thanks so much, Jay. Uh, nicely done out there, my friend. Uh, anybody who hasn't had a chance to check out what's going on at Cisco Investments, look them up. So many cool companies, so much interesting stuff. Speaking of interesting stuff, for everybody who is uh, uh, here at the show, one of the most popular places they always head to is over to the Cisco store. Why? Uh, that's where you get all the goodies. That's where you get all the great Cisco branded stuff. Do they ever bring them to me here in the studio? No, they don't, but that's okay. They are right over here to my right hand side and we want to take all of you on a quick tour of the Cisco store right now. Check it out. I'm going to be back in about two minutes. Hey guys, I'm standing here in front of the Cisco store, which is at the entrance of the hub in Hall 6. We've got a tour set up and they're going to show some of the smart store technology that Cisco has developed with our partners for our customers in the retail industry. If you follow me, we'll go check it out. The Cisco store is where you can come and buy merchandise from Cisco, like water bottles and hats and that sort of thing. But what we're actually uh, showing here today is uh, like a demo of our smart retail solutions. Cisco Vision is our dynamic signage solution, which allows us to change manually any of these signs with a click of an Apple device. DNA Spaces is capturing information of anyone that has a device. So basically, I, I can tell how many people are around the store, I can tell how long you've dwelled in certain spaces. As a retailer, that allows me to understand more about my customer, and it also allows me to personalize some of the experiences for you. Outside here, you'll see a couple of MV12s. These are our security cameras. 
I can toggle back and forth to different views inside the store. So you're starting to see how all the technology is connected together. One of the cool things that you can do is use uh, augmented reality through the partnership with Oculus to get inside of the camera and zoom in to your space. The store is outfitted with RFID sensors. If I were to walk out of the store, it will trigger a notification on the associate's device and with Cisco Vision, uh, trigger a notification that help is on the way. So if I come into this fitting room, it's gonna recognize the item that I have, and it's also gonna show some recommended products that go along with this. I can click on a different size and request that. All the associates on the floor are going to get a message on their phone that says, hey, there's a task in the dressing room. You can connect all the channels in your ecosystem with this smart fitting room. So we have some really amazing solutions around people counting, smart fitting rooms. We've even got a VR headset that you can use to see what the inside of the store layout's gonna look like. That really helps retailers to, to digitize their in-store experience. If you wanna learn more about this topic, check out the virtual tour on our website and you can find out more there. All right, now we're going to turn our attention to another really amazing aspect of Cisco, something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts here within the Cisco organization, and that is corporate social responsibility. We have a goal here at Cisco to positively impact a billion people by the year 2025. Uh, one way we're going to achieve that is by supporting a lot of nonprofits who are out there utilizing technology in such innovative and cool ways to address some of the world's challenges. Um, we've got a lot of representatives from different nonprofits who have supported uh, uh, Cisco and who Cisco is supporting, who join us here at Cisco Live this week in Barcelona. We hope you will get to know them as well. We are talking about their work all week long in the Impact Theater, and we've been delivering you some of that information. We will continue to do so throughout the course of the rest of the broadcast tomorrow. But right now, we are going to head out to Nish. And Nish, where are you? Are you in the you are in the Impact Theater, I can see. Hey there, friend. <laughs> hey, Steve. Yes, I'm here in the CSR Impact Theater, and I'm joined by Amarinth and Peter. Hey, guys, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you doing, Peter? Good, very well, thanks. So both of you have had some speaking slots here at the Impact Theater. Can you tell me a little bit about what you talked about, why we're here? Sure. Um, so I'm here representing Simprints Technology, and we make and deploy biometric technology in frontline contexts. Um, should I continue? Okay. Yeah, tell us more. <laughs> well, to understand the reason that we're making this technology, you have to understand the problem that we're trying to solve. And it's a big problem, but it's something that actually not a lot of people know about. So did you know that... Go on, tell me more. I'm intrigued. <laughs> did you know that nearly a billion people in the world don't have access to any form of official identification? Um, and this creates a lot of problems for people because they can't access a lot of the benefits that participating in society can provide if they have no way to prove or um, verify their identity. And so we're creating solutions that help, particularly in the healthcare context, overcome this barrier. That's amazing, thanks for sharing. And Peter, I'd love a bit of context. I know you've uh, done the same as well. So tell me a little bit more about ACFO. Yeah, we're a non-profit and we're trying to help people that don't have access to clean drinking water to provide it. And specifically, we're helping our partners in developing countries to collect, uh, analyze and use that data to improve their work. And with the support of Cisco, we've been developing a smartphone-based water quality monitoring tool. So it becomes easier to collect uh, water quality data at scale in these countries and so that that data can be used to improve uh, programs that our partners run. Got it. So obviously we're here in the impact theater, so I'm going to focus in on the word impact. So what impact are your solutions having um, in, on the world and in our communities? Yeah, um, I love that question because while fingerprints are interesting, that's not why we're in it. Um, in, I'm going to just drill in on one of the programs that we've been working on. Um, we've been providing pre and postnatal care to mothers in urban slums in Bangladesh. Um, and this program was really interesting because we were able actually to do some real measurements on it. And we found that biometrics increased the number of prenatal care visits that women received by nearly 40% which is pretty significant. Um, and women were 30% more likely, nearly 30% more likely to have a, a birth care plan and their newborns received 11% more care visits. And this is really important because the perinatal period, the, the weeks before and after giving birth are the most risky and the most deadly for these women. 
That's amazing. Congratulations on the impact that you've had so far. And I know that you're going to have continue to have a further impact. Peter, can you tell me a little bit more about ACVO and the impact you've had so far and what you're hoping to do? Yes, I'll, I'll do it with an example as well. So we, we've been deploying this smartphone-based water quality testing solution in Sierra Leone, where we help the government to map the water quality uh, status of 11,000 communities, so quite large. And based on the data that was provided, we were able to help the government better target their resources and their policies. And that led to what we estimate is half a million people that have more access to clean drinking water and sanitation in Sierra Leone alone. So it has a massive impact, and that is uh, partly possible by the contribution of Cisco. So there's multiple factors that play into it, but data is a crucial piece of solving that puzzle. Absolutely. It's amazing what technology can do. So obviously you both have received funding from Cisco. So what has that funding enabled you to do, just in a few sentences? Well, with Cisco's support, we are developing facial biometrics, which is really important because a lot of the communities where we work, people are working with their hands. And it means that their fingerprints are worn, scarred, burned, and it means that we can't get good reads on them. So with Cisco's support, we're creating a new tool that will be more inclusive. Amazing. And how about you, Peter? Yeah, the, so the investment or the, the grant that we got is really used by our software developers, so pure for coding and product development, and that's a hard part to, to get funding for as an organization like us. And we've used it to integrate our mobile app with over 100 testing methods, and also making sure that the data is collected is automatically synced to databases and dashboards that our partners can use for better decision making. Amazing. So what are your, some of your hopes and dreams for the work that you're doing? I'll come to you first, Peter. I would like to see more of the energy and the power of the people in here that have a tech and data you know, mind to, to also think about how they can apply it for the good. I'm sure a lot of the people are already doing that, but I think there's so much more potential uh, to, to yeah, basically apply that potential of technology for, for the good. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Amazing. And hopes and dreams for you. How about you? Um, Identity is really useful when it can be used across multiple contexts. So my hopes and dreams for the work that we do is that the identities we create for people get linked up across programs to enable people to access more services more seamlessly. Got it. So one last question for you. Obviously, we're here at Cisco Live Barcelona. There's like 17,000 people here. So why did you choose to share some of the work that you're doing here at Cisco Live? Um, I would say two main reasons. Um, one is because the problems that we're working on aren't that well understood by a lot of people and the people who come to Cisco Live are technology savvy and with it and I want to share the problems that we're trying to address with everyone so more people can get involved in creating the solution. Um, and then the other one is because I want to you know, be a part of sharing the good work that Cisco is enabling us to do with other members of the community. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, for sharing some of the uh, amazing insights into some of the things that you've been talking about here at the Impact Theatre. Steve, we're heading back to you. We're going to wrap up the day. Thank you, Nish. Great job, Amaranth and Peter. Really, really nice final insight and inspiration for all of us. We are at the very end of our show day tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Sandeep Mera and Ari Barav talking about the workplace transformation, specifically enabling the way users work, making sure that they can work the way they want. Please be with us here on the live broadcast. And remember, continue reaching out to us using that hashtag. Hashtag CLE, you are on all forms of social media. Remember to continue to tune in to what's happening in our other broadcast, uh, which is over in the Master Series. We want to keep seeing you there as well, but we are grateful to have you on the stream with us. Let everybody know they've got another full day, CiscoLive.com. Click on the yellow box and you can stream it live yourself. My name is Steve Moulter, and on behalf of myself and my three co-hosts, Nish Parker, David Dela Cruz, Zane Powell, it's been a pleasure. Have a great night and we will see you tomorrow.